Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. And I know there are many things you could be doing on a Friday afternoon about 4 o'clock <laughs> <laughs> sitting here, but I appreciate you being here. So I, I thought I'd just tell you briefly about my career. I was a Stanford undergrad back in the days when uh, tear gas was prevalent on the campuses. Uh, we won uh, two Rose Bowls with Jim Plunkett. That ha that's how old I am, Jim Plunkett. And uh, I was going to medical school. And someone told me, hey, you can improve your chances of getting into medical school if you go and work in a lab. And that's what I did. I went to the Stanford Medical <laughs> School, and I worked in a lab, and I fell in love. And what I fell in love with was the smells. <laughs> These aero ketones, they just had me from the beginning. <laughs> and I uh, actually published a paper. And then someone said, you know, there's this thing called an MD-PhD program. Not only uh, you know, they, they, you can get both degrees, and they pay your way through medical school, and, and it was just perfect. And so that's what I did. I, actually, I got into Stanford's MD-PhD program, but they said, well, Warner, we're not quite organized yet. Again, that's how old I am. Uh, uh, we can't pay your tuition the first year. Ooh, that was a problem. So. <laughs> I was from Missouri, and I went to Washington University uh, uh, in St. Louis, uh, Washington University Medical School, and it has the best, bar none, the best MD-PhD program in the country, even today, uh, has the best MD-PhD program. And then, um, but I studied immunology, no, viral, no viruses yet in my life, uh, studied lymphocyte activation. After that, I went to the MGH at Harvard to, to do my internship in residency. So it's this constant changing of hats. You know, you're in the lab, then you're in the clinic, then you're back. And then the next, so after two years of internship in residency, the only viruses I saw were people infected with viruses. Uh, I went to the National Institutes of Health. And this is, um, uh, there had been this revolution in, in, in science called molecular biology that happened since I'd done my my uh, degree, and so I wound up retraining myself in molecular biology, and we actually cloned uh, the IL-2 receptor alpha chain. You probably know it as CD25. It was the first cytokine receptor ever to be cloned. Uh, there were no kits. There was <laughs> but IL-2 receptors were prevalently expressed upon cancer cells that were infected with the human T-cell leukemia virus. That's my first connection to viruses was that there was de this deregulated expression of IL-2 receptors. And that's been exploited as a therapeutic to treat ATL uh, patients. But it was also at that point in time that on the branch I was working at the, at the Cancer Institute, the first patient with AIDS was admitted to the NIH for analysis. And I, was the, I had had the last case. We were ta there were seven of us taking clinical cases in rotation. I'd had the last one. And so the next one went to this young hematology uh, resident or fellow from Hopkins. And what ensued was the most, the tra one travesty after another in terms of the, the young man suffered from every complication of AIDS. And this young H Hopkins fellow complained so bitterly to my, our branch chief that when it came time to take the second patient, the branch chief decided, you know, maybe we won't take another one of these patients. Patient number two went to Tony Fauci, who made an entire career out of <laughs> HIV. Opportunity missed. <laughs> if I had just, if maybe if I had just been the one who had gotten the patient, I know maybe I'd have complained more, but it, th I've, I look back upon that as a real opportunity missed. But, that was an introduction to HIV. I, I moved then to Duke University as a Howard Hughes investigator. Oh, I've got to advance the slide. And started working on HIV myself. Um, and then it was almost now 20, almost 25 years ago that I was recruited back from Duke. I thought I'd never leave Duke. Uh, I had basketball tickets, ACC basketball tickets, <laughs> Duke Blue Devils, Bobby Hurley, Christian Leitner. It was great. But I, I moved back to, uh, 25 years ago, came back to San Francisco uh, uh, to found the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology, and I've been here ever since. So that, see, I can kind of made a big circle, kind of a loop. I feel like my life is kind of in that repetition as well. But what I would like to do today um, is tell you a, a, a story that has emerged 
l relatively late in the history of HIV that actually uh, has really caused me to pause. I, I can't tell you, every lab meeting over the these past several years when data was being presented, I'm saying, are you kidding me? It can't be, but it is. So uh, let me show you this story about, and it's a, it's a very basic story, and it's a story that attacks the question of how are CD4 T cells lost during HIV infection? And despite 30 years of study, we really still don't understand this very well. Of course, this is the depletion of this subset of cells that drives clinical progression uh, to AIDS. So what was known? There were two principal death pathways that had been proposed. First, productive infection of the CD4 T cell, of course. You, you lose CD4 cells because the virus infects and grows there. But these activated, productively infected cells are too few and far between to explain the massive CD4 T cell losses that are encountered during HIV infection in patients. This led to the notion that, well, maybe uninfected bystander cells are somehow lost as well. So these infected cells how, somehow projecting evil upon the surrounding CD4 T cells, causing them to die. And the, 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 the thought was probably membrane signaling through OM to co, uh, CD4 and co-receptors, but some type of, of, of communication here that led to the death of these bystander CD4 T cells. That's where the, the field really kind of stood when we started our studies. And uh, a key, in retrospect, an absolute key was that to use lymphoid tissues. We chose to use lymphoid tissues in part because that's where most of the CD4 T cells reside and that's where most of the virus is replicating. We used tonsil and spleen, and, uh, and it was really a pleasure to be on the program with Andreas Jekyll, who, who actually pioneered this system in Mark Goldsmith's laboratory and did some of the first what are called human lymphoid aggregate cultures. But then Andreas went off to, to, to earn his fortune in biotech, and uh, so we were left with this system and continued to study uh, what was happening in terms of CD4 T cell demise. Gilad Deutsch, uh, at that time, a fresh postdoctoral fellow, uh, came to the lab and, and took up the project. And this is an example of, what, uh, of a typical tonsil infection. Here we're using a green fluorescent virus, so productively infected cells here, on, for example, on day six. And you don't have to add any mitogens or stimuli to these tonsil cultures. One to 5% of the cells are activated sufficiently to support a productive infection. Here we see about 1.5% of the cells are green, uh, indicating that the virus is replicating, and they've also downregulated CD4, another feature of productive infection. But these are the bystander cells, these, uh, these cells here that are not infected. And we see they're quite, uh, they're nicely represented on day six, but look, three days later in culture, they're virtually gone. And this is a profound depletion of CD4 T cells. And so we spent the next 10 years trying to figure out what was going on here. So let's fast forward 10 years. What did we find? We found, in fact, that 95% of the, of, the, of the cells in this culture were dying as a, that, in fact, these are resting CD4 T cells. The, the vast majority of CD4 cells that the virus runs into are resting. And these cells are non-permissive for HIV infection because of expression of a restriction factor called SAMHD1. This impairs the reverse transcription of the virus, leading to incomplete reverse transcripts. Now, interestingly, in these resting cells, there is a DNA sensor that senses those incomplete transcripts and triggers an inflammatory response that leads to inflammasome assembly, caspase-1 activation, and cell death by a pyrototic pathway. I'll tell you in terms of, I'll show you data the, to, to support each of these uh, steps uh, and including identification of the DNA uh, sensor. So uh, this is, uh, now so you might say, what's pyrotosis? I certainly said, what's pyrotosis? Uh, and it turns out it's a form of programmed cell death that is critically dependent upon the activation of caspase-1, commonly seen in bacterial infections, salmonella, shigella, et cetera, all hands on deck type of inflammatory response to remove an infectious threat. Um, 
and, in, and, and it's this cast activated caspase 1 that's also processing pro IL-1 beta and pro IL-18, pro in, uh, highly inflammatory cytokines. And the caspase 1 activation ultimately leads to pore formation, and all of the cytoplasmic contents leak out of the cell into the extracellular space, a very inflammatory form of, of programmed cell death. So we, we looked in our system and, and, and asked in the tonsil uh, cultures where the CD4 T cells were being depleted, we could in fact block that depletion with inhibitors of caspase 1, but not inhibitors of caspase 3, which commonly block apoptotic uh, pathways. Um, interestingly, we could also see that poor formation and release of cytoplasmic contents monitored by lactic dehydrogenase release. We see that the, the infection releases LDH. It's blocked by caspase 1. Uh, it's blocked by antiviral agents and blocked by caspase 1 inhibitors, but not by caspase 3 uh, inhibitors. We went on to, to provide a genetic proof that caspase 1 was involved in the cell death, knocking down caspase 1 in these resting CD4 T cells. We could, in fact, rescue the cells from, uh, I'm sorry, with HIV, we could rescue the cells from death uh, with either a caspase 1 knockdown or an ASC, a, an inflammasome uh, 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 cofactor. And, uh, and both were effective at removing the cell death, whereas uh, knocking down uh, caspase 3, or actually, interestingly, the NLRP3 subunit of, of the NLR receptors, uh, that was not rescuing. Uh, that, however, did rescue nigerosin-induced death, which is known to proceed through the NALP3 inflammasome. These data suggested that what that cell death was not involving the NALP3 inflammasome, although caspase, an, an inflammasome was involved Involved, and caspase 1 is being activated. So the next question was, well, how are these DNAs, these incomplete reverse transcripts being sensed? So we, by I mean we, I mean Kate Monroe, a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory who actually trained here at Berkeley with Russell Vance, Jiwan Yang, a postdoctoral fellow, they set out to find the, the enhancer, uh, the, the sensor. They used a DNA, uh, an, an affinity approach whereby uh, single or double-stranded DNA was uh, attached to streptavidin or uh, biotinylated and then pulled down with streptavidin beads. Ultimately, we would silver stain, electrophoresis, but more importantly, submit all of these materials for mass spec in collaboration with Nevin Krogan and Jeff Johnson. So the top six mass spec uh, uh, proteins identified turned out to be four DNA repair enzymes and interestingly, two inflammas known inflammasome-associated uh, proteins, IFI-16 and IFIX. With this in mind, we went back and, and looked at our DNA, uh, our pull-downs, and in interrogated those pull-downs for whether or not IFI-16 was present. It was. IFIX, yes, it was. And then one of the DNA, uh, one of the Ku proteins, that one of its subunits is DNPK1, it was also present. So these became our three leading candidates for what the sensor uh, might be. So we knocked down IFIX uh, in these cells, no effect upon cell death. The, the, the cells continued to die. We knocked down DNPK1, still the, the, the cells continued to die. But when we knocked down IFI16, we saved the cells. They were no longer uh, dying. This left, led to the conclusion that, in fact, the abortive infection and incomplete reverse transcripts occurring in these resting CD4 T cells were being sensed by IFI-16, a rather pleasing sensor in the fact that IFI-16 can form its own inflammasome, recruit caspase-1, and mediate the pyrotonic uh, response. Now, IFI-16 can also, through Sting and TBK1, launch an interferon response. And, and, and we questioned or we wondered whether or not the interferon response was necessary for the pyrotonic response. It appeared not to be the case because when we blocked interferon receptors effectively, uh, the pyrotonic response uh, con uh, continued within these cells. So these, it, IFI-16 appears to be orchestrating two different types of innate immune responses within these resting CD4 T cells. These data led to, this, to, the, to the conclusion that bystander CD4 T cell death occurring during HIV infection is mainly a suicide, reflecting innate immune response against the virus and not a murder, not a virological uh, murder. So we think that this, 
infection, abortive infection, pyrotosis, inflammation, release of chemokines, and recruitment of new cells, that this sets up a, 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 an inexorable cycle uh, that underlies HIV uh, pathogenesis. Um, and that this zone of it, that the, the cells are being recruited to zones of inflammation within lymphoid tissues where they undergo this, this process of, of abortive infection, pyrotosis, and recruitment of new cells. Now, how can you break that cycle? Well, the key enzyme in this whole pyrototic death cycle is caspase 1. We were very pleased to learn that Vertex had created and had actually developed a caspase-1 inhibitor and had tested it in, in phase two trials in humans and had been shown to be safe and well tolerated. Unfortunately, they hadn't found a disease in which it was a great therapy for. So we suggested that, well, maybe, <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, so Vertex, we took VX765, it works beautifully in, in, in tonsil, it works beautifully in spleen, uh, and Interestingly, we even then, in collaboration with Kim Heisenkrug and Kim Lavender at the Rocky Mountain Laboratories, Vertex gave us enough drug, enough, enough VX765, to do a humanized mouse experiment. Now, we've really only done one good mouse experiment so far, but I'll show you the results of this. So the idea is to daily, uh, twice a day, this is an orally bioavailable drug, so twice a day, they're gavaging. These, these mice with the, with the drug. Not an easy experiment in terms of, Kim, Kim is threatening to have me come out there and help lavage, gavage the, uh, the animals. But what we found was at 24 days after infection, in the uninfected animals, this is the level of CD4 T cells. In the animals infected, but receiving the vehicle, the CD4 depletion was, was significant. But in the animals receiving VX765, there was a significant improvement in the CD4 uh, T cell count. Furthermore, the viral loads in the vehicle treated in VX765 were equivalent. So you couldn't explain the differences based on viral load. The, um, also, if you look at IL-18 production, remember, pro-IL-18 is processed by caspase-1, released into, uh, into the extracellular space. We see that in the presence of, of, of uh, the VX765, that there is a profound uh, inhibition uh, of IL-18 release, which is occurring quite uh, uh, at a high level in the vehicle-treated animals. So that's a preliminary set of experiments, but certainly uh, as a first pass in vivo looks like the pyrotonic pathway is playing out and that VX765 can inter interdict the pathogenic this, this pathogenic cycle leading to CD4 T cell depletion and inflammation. So, so what are we doing differently? Why is this pyrotonic pathway just showing up now, 30 years into this epidemic? Well. In general, blood CD4 T cells had been used in most experiments. Blood is easily accessible. Not everybody's going to say, here, take my tonsil or take a lymph node. Um, so the question is, do they die by pyrotosis, like lymphoid cells following HIV infection? Do these blood cells die? And so Issa Menusarios, uh, a UC Berkeley graduate student, spent uh, time in the lab, actually has completed her degree now, and sh this was her question, figuring out wh what happens to blood cells. So here's the typical tonsil experiment. So to infected tonsil cells mixed with bystander tonsil CD4 cells. We see that they're de the, the bystander cells are depleted, and that's rescuable with the uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor efavirenz. Interestingly, if you do the same cells with uh, the same type of experiment now, you have to activate the, the blood CD4 T cells to make them sensitive or, or, or infected with HIV. But in fact, uh, these cells are completely, appear completely resistant to this pyrotonic death pathway. But maybe you could say, well, maybe you're not producing enough virus by these activated PBLs. However, if you take those activated PBLs and incubate them with tonsil as the bystander cell, the tonsil cells are, are readily, uh, uh, they're readily depleted in the, in the, in the, in the system. We then moved to setting up a co-culture system where we had 293 T cells on plates and these cells are infected with HIV, and then layered on top of them are either blood CD4 T cell, blood cells, or tonsil cells, and, or both. 
And this turned out to be a very valuable system for dissecting what, what is different about blood cells versus tonsil cells. The first thing that we found uh, is, the first thing we found is that blood cells have much lower levels of reverse transcription than tonsil cells. They appear to be in a deeper state of rest. So both cells are resting, they're not dividing, but tonsil cells are more activated than blood cells. They're more able to support reverse transcription, thus generating the abortive transcripts that are sensed uh, than, than are the blood cells. Interestingly, what about the sensor? Well, it turns out that tonsil cells have about three times the level of IFI-16 messenger RNA compared to blood cells. And at the protein level, this is the level of expression of IFI-16 in the blood cells versus the expression in the tonsil. So not only do they not make the substrate, they can't sense whatever DNA is there because the IFI-16 is limiting. Now, we don't know that this is the only things that are wrong with the blood cells, but it certainly, this at least contributes to the, the inability of these cells to execute the pyrotonic death pathway. So then, the, our question then was, are there any conditions in which blood cells can actually be rendered sensitive to pyrotosis? Thank you. And so, in fact, if you mix the blood cells and the tonsil cells, we now see that the blood cells die. So it turns out that if, if you allow these cells to interact, the, it's, it's cellular alchemy. The tonsil cells somehow, these, these, these lymphoid tissue cells, somehow talk to the blood cells and render them sensitive to the pyrotonic death pathway. Now these cells, if you separate them in a transwell system, it, they don't die. They have to be able to interact. So a cell-cell interaction is important. We do not yet know the nature of that receptor ligand triggering that renders the blood cells sensitive, and we're really, really interested in that. Because you could see that you could use an antibody and render all cells resistant to CD4 T cell depletion if you could interrupt that, that sensitization step. It turns out sensitization can be mediated by CD4 T cells, but also by CD8 T cells from, from tonsil, and also by B cells. So it's some type of receptor ligand that's shared amongst all of these lymphoid tissue cells. And we think that, in fact, so in the blood, the CD4 T cells are resistant to pyrotosis. They, they have low re reverse transcription. They have low IFI-16. But when the cells go in here and experience cell-to-cell -cell interactions as is characteristic with lymphoid tissue, they are rapidly rendered sen sensitive to the pyrotonic pathway. So lymphocyte trafficking, so essentially they acquire and then they lose this sensitivity to the major HIV death pathway as they passage into and out of lymphoid tissues. These, these data underscore AIDS as a disease of lymphoid tissue, not blood, and they explain, likely explain why the pyrotosis pathway of cell death was missed for so long because mostly blood cells were studied and they don't die by this uh, pathway unless they are first incubated with lymphoid tissue cells. And in my final vignette, in two minutes, uh, I will tell you about what's the killing unit in, in HIV infection. Is it a cell-free virion? That's certainly the common uh, view. Or is it possibly HIV-infected cells? Nicole Galloway, a BMS graduate student, performed these studies. Early on, we realized that in terms of the pyrotonic pathway, that if we separated the infected cells from the bystander cells, we did not lose the CD4 T cells, suggesting that a close cell-to-cell -cell interaction was required to execute the pyrotonic death pathway. Now, these findings suggested that maybe the virological synapse is important. Now, passage of virus across this uh, virological synapse is 100 to 1,000-fold more efficient than infection with cell-free virions. It's formed, the synapse is formed by LFA1 and ICAM1. And so we used antibodies against ICAM1 and LFA1 to disrupt the virological synapse, and sure enough, we could prevent cell death. Now, not a perfect experiment because there are little bits of ICAM1 and LFA1 on cell-free virions as well. But, so, but we went on to another study of looking at a biophysical approach to studying whether or not cell-to-cell -cell interaction and cell-to-cell -cell spread was important. And this is essentially, it's, a, it's, it's actually a simple experiment of taking the same number of cells and culturing them under conditions that make it increasingly less likely that they will interact with each other. 
So we went from V, from v bottom to U bottom to flat bottom 96 well, and then into the 24 well flat and a 12 well flat. And you can see that in this system at day four, you can absolutely titer out the death response by making it less and less likely that for the cells to interact. So in summary, a septet of, uh, uh, so in summary, the, the killing unit in HIV infection is in fact the infected cell. Uh, virions are great for productively, for getting a productive infection going, but in terms of the major killing mechanism that underlies depletion of CD4 T cells, that's a property of infected cells. So let me just summarize number, the, the septet of surprises. Most CD4 T cells die during HIV infection because of an innate immune response against the virus instead of a toxic effect of the virus. This was a new concept uh, when, we first, uh, when we first published uh, the work. Second, but it's not a new concept in other viruses. This is well known amongst viruses. Uh, cell death involves caspase one dependent pyrotosis, an intensely inflammatory form of programmed cell death. It used to be thought that all of cell death was apoptotic uh, during HIV infection. Number three, a pathogenic cycle of abortive infection, pyrotosis, inflammation, and new cell recruitment is established, resulting in a virtual grist mill for depleting the bystander CD4 uh, T cells. Number four, caspase one inhibitors can break this cycle and thus could form a new host-directed anti-AIDS therapy complementing virus-directed antiretroviral therapy. DNA sensing, inflammasome assembly, caspase-1 activation, and type 1 interferon production are all orchestrated through a single DNA uh, sensing protein, IFI-16. And finally, the, uh, uh, blood cells resist pyrotosis, apparently in part because they have reduced reverse transcription and reduced expression of IFI-16. And this probably explains why the pyrototic death pathway hadn't been detected until uh, recently. So you can see if we had used blood cells instead of those lymphoid, uh, instead of tonsil and spleen, we'd have completely missed uh, this death pathway. Cell to cell, and finally cell to cell transmission is obligately required for the induction of pyrotosis. Cell-free virions do not uh, suffice. So in summary, I just, I've mentioned many of these individuals and shown you their pictures along the way. Uh, a very talented group of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. I, we've had the great pleasure of, of collaborating with uh, individuals at UCSF and in the humanized mice with Kim and, and, and Carrie at the Rocky Mountain Laboratories. And I'd certainly like to acknowledge the funding from uh, NIH, CIFAR, a variety of, uh, of foundations, uh, et cetera. And I, Greatly appreciate your attention uh, here on a late Friday afternoon. Thank you. Uh, questions, go ahead. It, it seems you're hypothesizing that um, IFI 16 is a major determinant of susceptibility to, uh, to death. And it's interesting that despite the lower expression of IFI 16 in the blood cells, um, it seems you're able to rescue that phenotype through co-culture of mm -hmm. the lymphocyte with the blood cell, suggesting maybe that you, despite the lower expression of IFI-16, there's still a response. Ah, um, so but just, when I'm you do, I, I didn't have time to show you today, but when you do the co-culture, now IFI-16 levels climb, reverse transcription climbs, so the blood cells are, rent, are confer, they are now conferred a higher state of activation and, and permiss... Yeah. Yeah. I'm also wondering, to, to what extent is uh, SAM HD1 uh, required for this response? Ah, very insightful response. I have a question. I think SAM HD1 is a two faced restriction factor. I think SAM HD1 is fantastic in terms of defending us against cell free virions, but when it comes to the highly efficient cell to cell transmission, I think the SAM HD1 tries and tries and tries. And what it does is it creates the abortive infection. So I think in that setting, it's going to turn out to be a pro-pathogenic factor. And so in essence, most of CD4 depletion in HIV infection, because we know it accounts for 95% of the depletion, is going to be SAMHD1 dependent. And I would ask the same question about the blood cells too, with regard to SAMHD1. Uh, there, you know, so is SAMHD1 even more 
efficient there. We don't know that. We don't know that yet. Yeah. Sam HD1 expression is about the same between tonsil and blood, but it could have different enzymatic activity. Um, yes. This is this is a two-sided question. The first side is a bit of semantics. Um, uh, is it proper to call these cells bystander cells when it requires that they actually have a board of infection? So, so they're they're not actually you know innocent bystanders. Yeah, actually. that that's the I you you're absolutely right. The they are they are effectively binding and fusing the virus. They're just not supporting the full replicative life cycle of HIV. They are arresting at reverse transcription. I use the term bystander really in, as, a, as a way of connecting uh, a continuity between these cells that surround the productively infected cell. But you know, you're right, they are abortively infected cells nearby a productively infected cell. So, so the second part of the question involves true bystanders, and those, uh, so Ed Engelman showed that a single infected cell can recruit up to 100 non-infected cells and kill them all by uh, syncytia formation. And so with regard to the assertion, especially because we're measuring CD4 levels in the blood rather than in the lymphoid tissue, so re with regard to the assertion that the majority of cell death occurs uh, in the lymphoid tissue, uh, I mean, what, what proportion occurs in the lymphoid tissue and what proportion actually occurs in the blood through a variety of true bystander mechanisms like sensation formation? Um, I think that, you know, I think most people in the field would, would say categorically that the disease is occurring in the lymphoid tissue. The blood is, is simply a conduit of cells Back, back and forth to the lymphoid tissue. So that's where the action is. That the viral loads are 10 times higher in the tissue. Uh, uh, blood is really, uh, is really not that relevant. Uh, have you had a chance to look at, let's say, gut-associated lymphoid tissue where yeah. there is a lot of uh, cell, T cell death and all that? So we have tried to look at gut-associated lymphoid tissue. We can get tonsil and we can get spleen, and they survive overnight shipment. If, when we get gut from uh, CHTN or NDRI, the gut, I mean, these samples are very friable. So you have to work with fresh samples. Uh, we've, so we've gotten surgical samples. And what we, I, I think the, the situation is as follows. There is a range of activation. I've shown you that blood cells are the least activated. Tonsil and spleen are a little bit more activated. Gut even more activated than that. And so there is a range of different, and so the more activated you become, you become now ultimately permissive to HIV replication. So there's more cells there that are productively infected. Yet there's still about 50% of the cells in gut that are sensitive to this pyrotonic pathway. But it's more of a one-to-one -one as opposed to in lymphoid, like in tonsil, five productively infected, 95 dying by pyrotosis. So the ratio changes depending upon the activation status of the cells in the particular tissue. And level of IFI 16, I guess, would yeah. be another thing to look at. Yeah. And actually, just sort of a related question. How about the non-pathogenic SIV infections? Yeah. OK, so as Paul well knows, there's been over 40 species of monkeys in Africa that are infected with a lentivirus, a species-specific lentivirus. And over the tens of thousands of years the, the, where the virus and host have evolved, they have all evolved to, non, to become non-pathogenic. Yet the solution to the lentiviral challenge is not to suppress the virus. The viral loads are very high. What the solution is, is to suppress the host response or change the host response to the virus. And we are very interested in the notion of maybe the solution is to get, to get rid of this pyrotonic pathway. We know that those Sudi Mangabe monkeys that are, are not, their, their cells are not, they're not immunologically activated, there's no inflammation. So those are the, the kinds of things you would get rid of if you could block the pyrotonic pathway. And one, one gene product that these, 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 these viruses encode is VPX. What does VPX do? It degrades SAMHD1, what I'm proposing as the pro-pathogenic factor. If you don't have a VPX, it turns out that those other viruses encode a VPR that does the same thing, degrades SAMHD1. So 
Uh, I think that I think the pyrotonic pathway and working out ways of getting around it is going to be a, a, a and not maybe the only explanation, but certainly a contributing factor to non-pathogenicity in the SIV model. There, there were a group of skeptics, including Peter Duesberg and Kerry Mullis, who argued, yeah. who, who argued that in, there was no real um, causal mechanism establishing how HIV caused AIDS. Um, given your findings, would you actually agree that they were at least asking the right questions? You know, I, I, I laugh because it was about 15, well, maybe almost 20 years ago that I would, the, the American, the, the AAAS was having some, the Pacific Division was having some celebratory and they had Peter Duesberg, Kerry Mullis, and they had this whole panel lined up to talk about HIV AIDS. And the AAAS administration in Washington, D.C. said, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster. And they, said, they called me and said, would you, would you go and represent, you know, kind of traditional thinking around, around this? And so I went. And for, I sat there for the entire day. I listened to Duesberg and to Mullins talk about, Mullins talk about, uh, Kerry Mullins, talk about uh, HIV coming or AIDS coming from wet, dark places. Um, I, I heard from another person that it was all a plot by the U.S. military against uh, people of color. And, and then, at the end of the day, it was my turn. <laughs> and the, the organizer got up and said, we've run a little over, Dr. Green, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I mean, it... <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not funny. I mean, Duesberg efforts in South Africa led to the death of over 250,000 children who were prevented from getting uh, antiretroviral therapy. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not answering your question, but. No, no you're not actually. The, the, it's actually a scientific question about causality. I, I really could not care less about the, the politics here. Um, Duesberg's argument was that we don't actually have a mechanism here. And it turns out you're saying that actually he's wrong. You have a mechanism now. That's, that's basically it. For, that, that, I, that's, that's I do question. think, I think this is the major mechanism by which CD4 T cells are depleted. It does require a productively infected cell next to a resting CD4 T cell and cell to cell transmission of that virus with pyrotosis. Thank so, you very much. That was okay. a question.